we start off by giving a big, huge hand praise to our heavenly daddy. Yes, sir. And while you're on your feet, can we give a huge round of applause for our pastor, Pastor Ricky Russ? To God be the glory to the Rush family, Sister Rush, Christian, Caden, we appreciate you so much. Y'all are amazing. Everybody, you may be seated. All right, now, everybody doing good? Yeah. Is everybody blessed? Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. We want to thank God for this amazing church. IBOC has always been an amazing church, and I'm just so thankful and so grateful for this opportunity. We are amazing because we have some amazing deacons at IBOC. We are amazing because we have amazing servants at IBOC, hospitality, parking lot crew, ushers. Glory to God for them. We are amazing because we have an amazing lion's den up front right here of some great men of God. We have an amazing choir here at Inspiring Body of Christ Church. I got to tell a quick story. My youngest son, Jojo, I'm going to embarrass him several times today. My youngest son, Jojo, you know, sometimes he's around the house and he's just singing some songs. And the other day he was just like, really been good, really been good, really, really been good to me. I believe you will. Yeah, yeah. And I said, no, no, what did you say? He said, really been good to me. I believe he will. Heck yeah. That would be my son. They're not saying, heck yeah. They're saying, take care. I believe he'll take. No, dad. They're saying, I believe he will. Heck yeah, he will. <laughs> Man, that's my son, my family. God bless. We have amazing praise dancers in the house today. Mm-hmm. We have some amazing born-again musicians and amazing audio-video crew. The restaurant in the deep after service, you got to go get your Kool-Aid pickle. Do we still have Kool-Aid pickles? Oh, I hear silence in the room. No Kool-Aid pickles. God bless us. When we get those again, make sure you get yours. Uh, let's see. We have a great aquatics team here at IBOC. Glory to God for them. As a matter of fact, I can say this with certainty. We are going to have a touch tank at the main lobby after service, you'll be able to go and touch some sea creatures. Where else in the world can you do that? At a church, nowhere but IBOC. So that's going to be in the back right after service. We have an amazing group of people who are near and dear to my heart. The U of D teachers and staff. Make some noise for the University of Dreams. Now listen, we are moving to brand new levels Okay, we just finished an amazing school year. We're moving to new levels, and let me tell you something. We have several people here, and they're going to have this card. As a matter of fact, I know our directors, Sister Baden, Sister Hunter are here. Some of our educators are here. We have some volunteers. I think some of our hospitality members have this card. If you want your child to be in a place that's positive, that's inspiring, that's challenging academically, and that will spiritually build up your kid, you need to get one of these people who are standing right now after service join them in the sound booth back there I'll be up here after service make sure you get with us and get this card it has a QR code on it and there is a simple interest survey that you can fill out if you want your child to be at the University of Dreams one more time everybody let's give it up for our amazing U of D teachers and let me add this, if you are interested in becoming a part of a, an, an inspiring professional community, if you want to be an educator at the University of Dreams, get with these same people because we are moving to new levels and we are changing the world. That's what I'm talking about. All right. We have some awesome volunteers all around the building who are doing all kinds of things behind the scenes. And I always want to make sure that we appreciate everybody here at the University of Dreams. We want to thank God for our pastor's recovery. He is recovering and... Throughout the months of June and July, we have some sensational summertime speakers. We have to add this and give a shout out to Pastor Sirwada from last week. Man! Last week, Pastor Sawada brought the word of God and every Sunday here at IBOC in the month of June and July. You can't miss it, everybody. We have great speakers who are going to give the word of God. So please make sure that you join us every Sunday. And of course, like Brother Antoine said, on Monday, we are going to get to see our pastor tomorrow, everybody. 
We are intentionally expanding, and you'll be able to see those videos. Make sure that you sign up, and of course, we can answer more questions after service on that. Everybody feeling all right? All right, so all of that is the intro. Let's start our time together publicly. Uh, I have been in education ever since 1999. My dad is a, ooh, somebody said ooh. My dad is a minister and a mailman. My mom was a teacher for about 29 years at L.K. Hall Elementary School in Oak Cliff. Uh, I've just come from a, a family full of educators and full of teachers. So if you don't mind, let's turn this church into a classroom like we always do. And uh, let's do something interesting today. I will be your teacher. My name is David Bowens. And we're going to start with a math lesson. Raise your hand if you love loved math when you were in school. Boy, I done already lost half the audience, golly. Some people are looking at me like, dog, I didn't come to church for no math. I'm sorry, God bless. Before we do this math lesson, let me do one quick thing. I was thinking about not doing it, but I'm gonna go ahead and do it. I'm gonna put a slide on the screen right now. And this is a picture of me and my son. One not one, one day and 10 years ago, 10 years and one day ago, June the 1st of 2014, uh, it was a Sunday and we had two services here and at the end of the second service, my wife gave birth to our second son. His name is Joe Joe Bowens and yesterday was his birthday. He is 10 years old. We celebrated his birthday yesterday. We had so much pizza and cake and all kinds of stuff. I looked at some old videos of my kids and man, it just made me shake my head and just say, time sure flies and you have to make sure that you take advantage of every day. I found a very embarrassing video of my son and I just want to play it for the whole world to see. Here we go. All right, boys, I need you to do me a favor. We are about to go into a restaurant. I don't need you embarrassing our family, embarrassing me and mommy, embarrassing our, our name, the Bowens name, or embarrassing the entire African-American culture race. Sit back. So raise your hand. I promise, I promise that I will not, that I will not embarrass, embarrass my family. Family. Repeat after me. I prom get raise your hand, please. I promise, I promise that I will, I will eat my food, eat my food and, drink my drink and drink my drink and not make a mess. Make raise, a mess. raise your hand. Stop messing with each other. Raise your hand. I promise Stop. that I will Stop. keep my hands to myself Stop. and keep my feet to myself and, keep my food and to not others. scream and, scream. and make loud, unnecessary noises in the restaurant. <laughs> Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. God bless all the kids. Jojo, I love you. I'm proud to be your dad. Happy birthday to you. All right, let's get to our lesson, everybody. Here we go. We are going to start off with our math lesson. Our math lesson involves one single number. Just about every time I speak in my school, my kids get tired of hearing it, but I say it all the time because to me it's a great reminder of the beauty of life. There is a number that we're about to put on the screen, and in my opinion, it's the most important number in the whole wide world. Everybody do me a favor and say this number. Everybody say 25,550. One more time, 25,550. Yeah, buddy, for me today, June 2nd, 2024, this is the day that I'm on. This is, for me, I have been alive 17,118 days. Now, back to that number, 25,550. That is the average number of days that the average person is alive. I read it in a book called The Purpose Driven Life. 25,550 days equals about 70 years. So according to whatever age you are, you kind of do the math. For me, June the 2nd of 2024, today is day 17,118. I have two amazing sons. You've already seen them. And what we're going to do in this math class is we're going to hit some pie charts really, really quickly. And we're going to do one pie chart of my son, Joseph Bowens. This is his pie chart. He is 10 years old, and for him... 
today is day 3,654. Now, on this pie chart, the red represents the days that he has lived. The blue represents all of the time that he has left. So if he is 10 years old, the blue represents all the 60 years that he has left to live his life and do everything. According to this pie chart, Joseph Bowens does not have to worry because he has a long life left. Although everyone in this building already knows that young people pass away too. Young people die too. But just for this example, Joseph is pretty set. Here's the next circle graph I want to show you. This is the circle graph of my son, Joshua Bowens. He is 13 years old. For him, today is day 4,913. Once again, the red represents the life he has lived or the days he has lived. The blue represents all the 50-something to 60-something years that he has left to go. Man, if you just look at that circle chart, boy, Joshua doesn't have anything to worry about. He has a long life ahead of him. Now, let's go to my circle chart. My name is David Bowens. I'm 46 years old. God bless you, too. <laughs> the red represents the time that I have lived. And if I live to be 70 years old or more, the blue represents the time that I have left when I see this picture. I don't care if I'm talking in my classroom. I don't care if I'm talking to Coach Lynn's team. I don't care if I'm talking to IBOC. Man, when I look at that, woo, that makes me pay attention. That makes me say, with the blue that I have left, I cannot waste any more time with the blue that I have left, I better make sure I give it my all. With the blue that I have left, I better make sure I make a mistake and get back up, fall down seven times, get up eight times. I better make sure that I do what I can with the time that I have left. Next slide. This is a person who is near and dear to my heart. That's my daddy. That's my daddy. My dad is 80 years old, and today for him, God be the glory. <laughs> God be the glory. For my dad, today is day 29,427. This is what his chart looks like. So he has already passed his 170. And boy, he's on his second circle graph. That's what I'm talking about. When I see that circle chart, it makes me just say, boy, I got to do my best to spend time with my daddy. I got to make sure I call him in the morning. I got to make sure I say, hey, daddy, I love you so much. While you're here, I want to make sure I do everything I can. Boy, I want to say last Tuesday we had a storm, and a storm blew his fence down. And, boy, myself and my sons, we were able to call Home Depot, set some stuff up. No, no, we're going to drive over there. No, dad, we already did it on the Internet. We already got you covered. We already took care of certain things. It was great to do that kind of thing, knowing that my dad has done so much for me, and we get to help him out. Love you, dad. So with that math lesson to start us off today, now we're going to get into the Word of God. We're going to learn some interesting things today in the classroom. We're going to go home and apply what we are living. Let's go to the Word of God. Here we go, everybody. Now, we have some amazing Bibles here, and I know our uh, hospitality team has offered them at least when you came in. So if you don't have a Bible, please raise your hand and we can get you one of these. We normally have them somewhere around. If you have a Bible app on your phone or your tablet or your device or something like that, please go ahead and go to uh, to that as we get into the Word of God, we're going to learn some interesting things today. We're going to go to Psalm chapter 119, verse 18. Psalm chapter 119, verse 18. If you have this easy-to-read Bible from the church, it's on page 549, page 549. Psalm chapter 119, verse 18. It's a really interesting scripture, and it says something really, really simple that we're going to learn about today. Psalm 119 and 18 in the easy to read version, it says, open my eyes so that I can see all of your wonderful things in your teachings. Open my eyes so that I can see all the wonderful things 
in your teaching. Class, our title for today is simple. Your title for today is, Do You See What I See? Do You See What I See? And at the bottom, there's a little subtitle. It says, Sometimes the solution is right here. Sometimes the solution The solution to the problem that you're trying to solve, the solution to whatever you're worried about right now, sometimes the solution is right here. Repeat after me, everyone. Sometimes Sometimes. it's right here and you don't even see it. Here we go, everyone. Now, we've already had our math lesson. Now in the classroom, let's go ahead and take our first test. I just lost the other half of the audience. Here we go. Already taking our first test. This is a very simple test, though, that we're about to take because it just requires you to look at the screens behind me. All you need for this test that we're about to take is the ability to count. Everyone do me a favor and focus on these screens. The instructions are simple. It says, count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you're counting. Mm -hmm. Right. Counting. And stop. All right. Here we go. Hopefully you're able to keep up with it. Your first test, this whole section over here, how many passes did you count? We got 14 here in the lion's den. Any other numbers? Okay, section two right here, how many passes? Say it out loud. 15, 14, 17, I heard a 17. Section three right here, how many passes did you count? 16. We got 16. It was a, how many did you count here? Somebody said nine. God bless you. God bless you. All right, here we go. Let's go back to the video. Back to the video. How many times did the people in white pass the ball? Let's go back to the video. The answer is 15 passes. Pause it. 15 passes. Now, you're in church, so don't lie. All right? Raise your hand if you really counted 15 passes. Really? Okay. Okay. Good stuff. I see you. Let's push play. Let's push play real quick, and we're going to keep on going right here. I got one more question for you. Pause. But did you see the gorilla? Don't lie in church, man. Don't lie in church. Raise your hand if you saw the gorilla. Raise your hand if you did not see a gorilla. A gorilla? You did not see the gorilla. You did not. See the grip. Thank you for being honest in church. I'll be honest with you. I I tested a couple of people uh, last week. Sister Margaret, Brother Antoine in the the control room. I tested a couple of people. I saw it. When I first saw this video, I did not, a gorilla, or as my family would say, a gorilla, I did not see a gorilla in that video. Here we go, camera crew. We're going to play it back. For those of you who raised your hand, and I was counting the passes. I did not see a gorilla. Let's go. Watch this over again. It's the same one. Here we go. Watch it. Okay. What in the? What? What? That is not. The, that cannot be the same video. Are you serious? All right. Pause it right here. Here we go. Now, some of you, me included, our eyes were wide open. Our eyes were wide open and we did not see something that was clearly on this big old screen. Everybody say, do you see what I see? Let's keep on going, camera crew. We got one more. Now watch this. All y'all who saw the gorilla, now you're going to be a... <laughs> now we get a chance to be smart. This is the second video. Instructions are the same. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. Everybody ready? Look at everybody, everybody leaning forward now. <laughs> God bless you. Here we go. Let's push play. All right. Wearing white. No, what that's fast? Yeah, Lee. 
Boy, that's too fast. Okay, okay, here we go. The question will come up, I think. The question's going to come up. How many passes? Now, that was fast. That was fast. Anybody have? Okay, Lions did eight. It was eight. I know it was eight. Let's go back to the video. That was too fast. I'm sorry. I edited that wrong. Let's go back to the video and see how many passes were in that one. Back to the video if we can. Correct. Uh-oh. 16 passes. It was too fast. It was too fast. My bad. My bad. But let's keep on going right here. Now, watch this. It's going to ask, that time, did you see the gorilla? Y'all so smart. Y'all are so smart. But watch this. Watch this. Hold on. Let's pause right there. Watch this. Did you see anything else change in that one? Yes. What? Huh? The background. Did anyone notice that the background changed? What color did it change to? Okay. It started off red and then the background changed to orange. Is there anything else that anybody saw? One person with a black shirt on, they're going to walk out of the shot. They're going to walk out of view. Let's watch it one more time. That one was kind of fast. I'll give it that. I think this last one is going to slow it down a little bit. Let's watch the end of that particular video. It says, if you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. Here we go. Let's go ahead and keep going. All right, so they're past. Yeah, that's the slow one. That's the one I should have had. It's okay. You have three people in black. Watch this lady. Watch this lady right here. And uh, she walks out. There's the gorilla. Gorilla. The curtains are now orange. And it goes to the end. All right. Now, what you just saw was a psychology experiment from 1999 that proved a simple theory. And the theory was your eyes can be wide open and you can still miss something. I saw it. I saw it with my own eyes. But you still missed something. This can apply to anyone who is young. This can apply to anybody who is old. Is it possible that you can see something but still miss something? Is it possible that you can see something but still overlook, neglect, pass over, skip over, leave out, forget about, not even notice something that's right in front of you? It's right there, but you didn't see it. God is asking a question to all of us today. Do you see what I see? I want to show you a couple of pictures of some people who went through some periods of their lives when they felt unseen. You ever felt that way? Let's see if you can see who they are. Slide number one. Here is a boy who was bullied throughout his childhood. He was molested by strangers and violently beaten by his dad. He said that he often woke up in fear on a regular basis, uncertain if his dad would brutalize him that day. There was one time where he was beaten so badly he was unconscious for three days. He describes his childhood as a living hell. What kind of future could a kid like this expect? This kid escaped real life by diving into the world of make-believe. Here is a boy who grew up to become the person that we know as Tyler Perry, director, producer, actor, and media mogul with a net worth of over a billion dollars. Do you see what I see? Here is a girl who felt completely isolated as a child, growing up in poverty and violence, rat-infested apartments, sometimes without running water or electricity. She experienced sexual abuse and witnessed her dad physically abuse her mom. What kind of future could a kid like this expect? The only thing that kept her sanity was escaping her real life into the world of acting. Here is a girl who grew up to become the person we know as Viola Davis, an Academy Award winning actress and producer. Do you see what I see? Here is a boy who struggled with depression throughout his life. A little known fact 
about this boy is that he attempted suicide twice before the age of 13. One attempt was after his grandmother died. He promised to stay home with his grandmother. But instead, on this one day, he snuck out of the house to see a parade. He's a kid, he wants to see a parade. When he returned home, he learned that his grandmother had passed away. And he felt so riddled with guilt that he jumped from a second story window to end his life. What kind of future could a kid like this expect? Glory to God, this kid didn't die because he grew up to fight for the lives of so many. Here is a boy who grew up to become the person that we know today as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Here is a girl who was born into poverty as a kid, facing years of physical and sexual abuse from age nine to age 12. She ran away from home at age 13. What kind of future could a kid like this expect? She was able to get in touch with her father and her life turned around. She used her voice to change the world for so many. Here is a girl who grew up to become the person that we know today as Oprah Winfrey. Here is a boy whose father left him and his mom at the age of two. He only saw his dad one other time. That was at the age of 10. At that meeting, he realized he had to figure out manhood on his, on his own. He was raised by his grandparents, but he still knew that growing up, he felt overlooked and out of place. What kind of future could a kid like this expect? This kid grew up to help many people who felt out of place and who did not feel valued. Here is a boy who grew up to become the person that we know today as Barack Obama. I think we have one more. Here is a boy. It's okay, come on. Here is a boy whose destiny has been tied to all of us, even if you're a visitor. His faith, his dependence on God, his ability to push through his energetic personality has affected all of us in some kind of way. Here is a boy who has endured the toughest of physical and emotional setbacks, and he still came out on top. Here is a boy who came from nothing, but we all know he was never nothing. What kind of future could a kid like this expect? I about family, do you see what I see? This person grew up to become Pastor Ricky Rush, the best regular old pastor ever. Do you see what I see. We just heard some stories of six individuals who overcame incredible odds to change the world. At some point in their lives, they felt neglected. They felt overlooked, passed over, skipped over, left out, forgotten, or even unnoticed, but God. So here's what we're gonna do. We're about to go to the Word of God, everybody. We're about to take a field trip through the Word of God to discover a little known person who was overlooked. I'm going to say it this way. I kind of mean it, but I kind of don't, but I kind of do. He was left out of the Bible, okay? Left out of the Bible. He did something, but he was left out. There are four Gospels in the New Testament. You got Matthew, you got Mark, you got Luke, you got John. And all of them talk about the life of Jesus. But here's the interesting thing about the Gospels. They don't all say the same things. For example, the uh, story of the prodigal son is only found in the book of Luke. It's not in Matthew or Mark or John. It's only found in the book of Luke. So Matthew recorded some things that he saw and heard, but Mark had a few different things. And, you know, Luke has some things and John has some things. They're all not all the same, but there are two stories in the life of Jesus that are in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
Those two stories are the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That's in all four Gospels. And the second story that's in all four Gospels is the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, okay, the 5,000 men. And we're going to examine this story, and we're going to see something that perhaps maybe you've never seen before. Everyone do me a favor, and let's get ready to take this field trip. John chapter 6. John chapter 6. We're going to start at verse 5, and we're going to read this story about Jesus feeding the 5,000. John chapter 6, you see page numbers on the screen if you had that easy to read Bible. John chapter 6, we're reading verses 5 through 12, and it starts on page 952, page 952 in this easy to read version. Here's what it says. Jesus looked up and he saw a crowd of people coming toward him. He said to Philip, where can we buy enough bread for all these people to eat? He asked Philip this question to test him. I love this next sentence. Jesus already knew what he planned to do. Verse 7, Philip answered, we would all have to work a month to buy enough bread for each person here to have only a little piece. Verse 8, another follower there was Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, and he said four words that you've heard me say several times already today. Here is a boy with five loaves of barley bread and two little fish, but that's not enough for so many people. Next, Jesus said, tell everyone to sit down. This was a place with a lot of grass. About 5,000 men sat down there. Jesus took the loaves of bread, gave thanks for them. Then he gave them to the people who were waiting to eat. He did the same with the fish. He gave them as much as they wanted. First cafeteria, Wyatt's cafeteria. There we go. Good stuff. All right. So that's the story in the book of John of the 5,000. Now, let's take another field trip. Here we go. Let's go to another book, one of the four Gospels. Let's go to Matthew. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 14, and we're going to read the same story. And I just want to ask a question. Do you see what I see? Let's read this one, Matthew chapter 14. We're just going to read four verses. We're not going to read the whole story. We're just going to read four verses, get into the main part of the story. It says, late that afternoon, page, I'm sorry, page 868 in the easy to read version, if you have that one. Starting at verse 15, late that afternoon, the followers came to Jesus and said, no one lives in this place. And it's already late, send the people away so they can go to the towns and buy food for themselves. Verse 16, Jesus said, the people don't need to go away. You give them some food to eat. The followers answered, but we only have five loaves of bread and two fish. Hold on, there's got to be something else. Let's go to the next one, verse 18. Jesus said, bring the bread and the fish to me. And he took the people, sit down in the grass, five loaves, and looked to the sky, thank God for the food. He broke the bread. You see what I see? Let's go to the next one. Maybe, maybe something was wrong. Let's, let's go to the book of Mark. Let's go to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. Something, something was weird about that. Mark chapter 6. In the easy to read version, it's on page 895. Page 895 if you have that Bible. Mark chapter 6. We're looking at each one of these gospels and we're looking at the same story in each of these gospels. Now we're looking at Mark chapter 6. We're just going to read four verses from here, verses 36 through 40. 36 says, so send the people away, one of the disciples said. They need to go to their farms and towns uh, around here to buy some food to eat. But Jesus answered, you give them some food to eat. They said to Jesus, we can't buy enough bread to feed all these people, man. We would all have to work a month to earn enough to buy that much bread. Next one. Jesus asked them, how many loaves, okay, how many loaves of bread do you have now? Go and see. They counted their loaves of bread. They came to Jesus and said, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. You see what I see? Jesus said to them, tell everyone sitting there in the groups of green grass. All the people sat in the groups of 50, 100 people. Say, 
There's something missing here. All right, we got one more. Hope Luke. Luke, come on through for us, Luke. Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. If you have your easy to read version, it's on page 924. Luke chapter 9. We're going to read five verses here, verses 12 through 17. Luke chapter 9, same story. Here we go. Late in the afternoon, 12 apostles came to Jesus and said, no one lives in this place. Send the people away. Okay, we've read that. They need to find food and places to sleep in the farms and the towns around here. Jesus said to the apostles, you give them something to eat. They said, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish. Do you see what I see? We just read through four separate books of the Bible. It was right there on the screen, just like the gorilla. We just read through four separate books of the Bible, four separate accounts of the same story. And if you saw what I saw, Matthew, Mark, and Luke neglected, passed over, skipped over, left out, forgot about, didn't even mention, didn't even give proper credit to the boy that God used to get the whole thing going. It was only in the book of John that the boy was mentioned. Matthew, Mark, and Luke didn't even mention the boy. Has that ever happened to you before? You ever done something at work? I'm like, right now, you know they're going to call my name. And they call him. You ever seen an awards show and they have the camera on all the people who were nominated and, and the winner is somebody else? Dirty dog, you know, something like that. Have you ever felt like you weren't seen? I think most people can say there's been a time or two in your life when you have felt that way. But I've got a better question that I want you to ponder today. Have you ever not noticed something that God was trying to show you? Have you ever overlooked, neglected to see, passed over, skipped over, left out, didn't even notice something that God put right in front of you? Have you ever overlooked a person, a place, or a thing that was right here? In the book of John it said, here is a boy. There's an interesting scripture that I want us to go to and I want us to sink in on this. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 24. If you have an easy to read version, it's on page 574. Proverbs chapter 17, Verse 24, here's what it says. Intelligent people think about what needs to be done here and now. Fools are always dreaming about faraway places. Let me say this, there's nothing wrong with dreaming. But it says intelligent people think about here. Think about now, right here. Fools are always dreaming about what's there. I want to go there. The foolish thing about that is, if you are always thinking about what's over there, then when you get over there, now you want to go there. And when you get over here, now I want to go, now I want to go here, now I want to see what's on, now. I'm, and when you're always going there, 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 you're not taking care of here. You're not seeing the blessings that are already here. There is nothing wrong with wanting more. There's nothing wrong with wanting to go to college in another state. There's nothing wrong with wanting to take that job over there. There's nothing wrong with that. However, sometimes the solution is right here. There's a story that was originally told by Russell 
Herman Conwell. He's the founder of Temple University in Pennsylvania. It's a true story of a Persian farmer in the 1800s. His name is Ali Hafed. He was a wealthy man who owned a lot of land near the Indus River near India. He heard tales about exciting stories of people making a lot of money finding diamond mines, and he got interested. He had a huge farm. He was a wealthy man. He was doing a lot of great things. However, he wanted to go there. There's nothing wrong with going there as long as you appreciate what's here. He decided, though, that he was just going to go ahead and pursue what was over there. And true story, he sold his farm. He moved his family, his wife and kids, in with a neighbor, and he used that money to go and find these diamonds in the 1800s. So he did that. He traveled to Africa and Europe, searching for diamonds without success. And finally, when he was broken, desperate, he threw himself into a river in Barcelona and committed suicide. Meanwhile, there was a man who purchased his farm. He used the same tools, and the same animals that that man had on his farm. And when he was farming, he always noticed these big, giant, black rocks and made it difficult for him to plow the lands. Always these black rocks. I got to get out of the way. He put some of those black rocks on his mantle in that guy's home. And one day a minister came just to uh, say hi to him and invite him to church. And when he looked on the mantle, he saw these black rocks and he was like, where did you get that? He was like, oh, man, they're all out in this field. I bought this farm not too long ago. All these black rocks are in this field. And he was like, sir, do you see what I see? That's a raw diamond, sir. That particular diamond that was on his mantle in the 1800s just happened to be worth $25,000, which in our time is worth millions. It was the discovery of the Golconda diamond mine in the area of India, one of the world's largest diamond mines. Ali Hafed took his own life and he literally owned acres of diamonds. It was right here and he didn't see it. Here's a question and I'm asking myself this too. What are you missing? What are you overlooking? Sometimes the solution is right here. Here is a boy. What are you missing? Let's play a game real quick, everybody. We're going to put a slide on the screen right now. And this game is going to be called You Have to Pick One. One of these paintings has to hang in your house after church today. One of them, all right? You got to pick one. Let's go to the next slide. Some of y'all can pick this one. That looks like something that a University of Dreams toddler created. Very interesting. Next one, not this one. Playing spades, playing crazy eight. Old maid, go fish, okay. We got this one. Ooh, okay. Is that Jesus? Is that a lady? Is that a man? Oh, okay. Uh, next one. All right, two ladies chilling outside, okay. All right, and next one. Are you of the kids doing something with the hands? I don't know what that is, okay? Let's go back and let's go forward, I'm saying. All five, okay, we got all five. Now you have to choose one of these to hang in your house today. Here we go. Let's start with the top right corner, the top right corner. Raise your hand if that's the one that you're gonna choose to take home today. We got one person right here, that's it. Okay, I see a couple of hands. Okay, not bad, not bad. So you just like the squiggly stuff. Let's go to the top left corner. The guy's playing cards, the top left corner. We can keep that up, that's fine. The top left corner, the top left corner. The guy's playing cards, the guy's playing cards. Raise your hand if you choose that one, if you choose that one. Got to take one home, got to take one. Okay, hands on that one, that was all right. Let's go to the bottom left corner, the bottom left corner. That looks like toddlers just doing stuff with paint. Raise your hand if you're taking that one home. You like that one, really? God bless you, okay. Let's go with the bottom row in the middle, the bottom row in the middle, the two ladies. Okay, looks like that one's number one, okay. At least those are people. 
That one looks like it took some talent. And let's go with this one in the bottom right corner. The scary. Ugh. I don't know. It's kind of scary to me. I don't want to wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning to get some ice cream and see that. God bless, man. That would make me turn around and go back to the bed. <laughs> okay, here we go. So we all chose those. What you are looking at right now are the five most expensive paintings ever sold at an auction. Here we go. Number five. Next one. Next one. Number five. This one is the fifth most expensive painting ever sold at an auction. It's called number 17A, painted by a guy named Jackson Pollock in 1948. Somebody looked at this painting and decided to pay $200 million for that? Repeat after me, do you see what I see? Man, I take that home now. Yeah, I like that one. Next one, here we go. Some of y'all, we can just keep it on there, guys. We can just keep it on there. Next one, number four. This one is number four. A lot of y'all chose this one. This one's number four. This one's called Nefe. I know I'll mess up that name. In English, it translates to, let me get my notes, let me get my notes. In English, this translates to, when will you marry? I guess this is two Tahitian ladies, and they're talking about, when will you marry? Nafi, Fai, Epopu, something like that. Paul Gangwin painted this in 1892. Somebody saw this painting. Now, some of y'all raise your hand and said you like. Somebody saw this and decided to pay $210 million for that. Repeat after me. Do you see what I see? Okay. Number three. Next one. Ooh, some of y'all raise your hand for this one. The card players. This was painted by a guy named Paul Cezanne. It was painted in 1892. Somebody looked at this painting and wanted it so much that they decided to pay. Oh my God, right. Somebody paid $250 million to have that hanging in their house. Next one, this one's number two, the number two most expensive painting. This is a U of D toddlers. Anybody can do that. It's called Interchange by Willem de Kooning. It was painted in 1955. This is said to be the most expensive contemporary art piece ever sold. Somebody looked at that and decided to pay $300 million. What in the world are you spending your money on? And number one, this one is called the scary picture. Ooh. This one is called Salvador Mundi. That is a Latin term, I believe, a Latin term that means savior of the world. This one was painted by Leonardo da Vinci in the 1500s. The interesting thing about this one was that the whereabouts of this painting, it was painted in the 1500s, but from 1763 all the way to 1900s, it was lost. People didn't know where it was. And then it was known as the lost Leonardo. This Leonardo painting, we know he painted something like this, but it's lost. Somebody has it in their basement or something. And it was found, it was examined. And when they found this one, when they found this one, somebody decided to pay $450.3 million for the scary man with his fingers up. Do you see what I see? I love the story of that one in particular because it gained value because it was lost. And then it was found. Ooh, it was lost. And then it was found. Man, man. Everyone do me a favor. Say, do you see what I see? Real quick, we're almost over, everybody. I want you to go back to John chapter 6 because we have to leave with a few solutions. As I was kind of going over and looking at these scriptures, yeah, I felt like the boy before, but I also know that I've done God that same way. I have neglected and overlooked some of the amazing things that he has put right in front of me. So the question is, how can we see like God wants us to see? How can we see like God wants us to see? All of the solutions are right here in John 
chapter 6. Number one, if you want to take notes or if you want to take some pictures, we got four things we're going to talk about and then we're done. Number one, if you want to see like God wants us to see, we have to know that it's already done. The disciples were facing a problem in all four of these gospels. The disciples were trying to feed all of these people. What are we going to do? How are we going to do it? Jesus came in John chapter 6, verse 6, and he said, he asked Philip this question to test him because Jesus already knew what he planned to do. Boy, it's a powerful thing to have a God that already knows. That Bible says, I know the plans I have for you. You better get with somebody who knows something. If you have a problem, if you have a situation, it's more comforting to be with someone who knows what to do. My sons, when they were small, man, they get in their rooms and they jump around in their beds, but oh, if we got a night when it rained or it was thundering, they'd run into the room with me and my wife. Why? Not because it made the rain go away, but it was just like there was more comfort just being around mommy and daddy in those times. There is comfort when Jesus already knows what he plans on doing. He already has plans, guys. So if we're going to see our situations like God wants us to see them, say, hey, man, here's what we got to do. We got to already know that it's done. Anyone who's ever been through a surgery, you know it's not just all easy peasy. There are some days where, all right, I feel better. I'm going to take a couple of steps. And then there are some days where, oh. But we already know as a church family that our pastor is going to recover and he's going to be better than ever. So what does that mean when you're going through your problems and you're going through your situations? See like God sees. It's already done. It's already done. Jesus already knew what he was going to do. The second thing that we have to do, if we're going to see like God wants us to see, the second thing is this. We have to know that my way won't do. We got to know that my way won't do. In John chapter 6, verse 7, boy, this guy Philip, I don't know what Philip looked like, but God bless Philip. In verse 7, John chapter 6, verse 7, Philip answered, we would all have to work for a month to buy enough bread for every person to have only a little piece. Philip was a planner. Philip was that person who got everything together. Philip was the person, if we looked at the next gen Bible or the gen X, gen Z Bible, Philip would be the person who would say, okay, all disciples, everybody get your credit card. You go to Walmart, you go to Minyards, you go to Tom Thumb, you go to the, and everybody buy some bread and meet back here and then we'll be able to feed all these people. Jesus is like, say, hey, mm-mm. If you want to see things the way I see them, you got to know sometimes that your way won't do. Have you ever tried something and like you really tried and you got stuff together and everything was perfect and all your plans just blew away? Man, that whole thing, I spent five hours on this and nothing worked out. Sometimes in certain situations, if you want to see like God sees, you got to understand sometimes that your way won't do. It doesn't mean you don't plan for things, but it does mean when you see things aren't working out, it's kind of... Okay, God, you just, you just go ahead and do your thing. I'm going to listen to you, and I'm going to do what we got to do. With the camera crew upstairs, we had some screens right here to go out and some screens that distribute all around the church that went out. And we were upstairs before service talking, hey, what are we going to do? Check this, check that. Okay, nothing's working. You know what? It's all good. We got screens over here. We're still going across the world on the Internet. Let's just go and preach the word and go and eat something afterwards. Sometimes you got to know my way won't do. God, you have your own way. Number three, we're almost done. Number three, number three, if you want to see like God sees, you have to know that God sees you. You got to know that God is not ignoring you. Look at John. Let's see, this one's going to be John chapter 6, verses 8 and 9. John chapter 6, verses 8 and 9, it says another follower there was Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter. Andrew was the one who said, here is a boy. Ooh, have you had some Andrews in your life who recognized you? You ever had a teacher? You ever had a coach? You ever had a family member who kept getting on your nerves? Go, baby. He can sing. He can, he'll get up and do you that. That's an Andrew. We got to thank God for the Andrews in our lives because the Andrews prove God sees you. 
Sometimes you want to sit back and let everyone else do something, and that's all right. But sometimes you're going to get an Andrew that says, no, you go, you go. Here he is. He's, he can do that. Those Andrews in your life prove that you have a God who sees you. You're not going unnoticed. And our very last one, if you want to see like God wants you to see, you have to know that there is more in store. In John chapter 6, verse 11, Jesus did something interesting before the miracle happened. The Bible says in John 6 and 11, Jesus took the loaves and he gave thanks. Why did he give thanks? Because he knew that there was more in store. So if we're going to see the way God wants us to see, man, we got to thank him in advance. Thank you in advance, God, for blessing our pastor and his family. Thank you, Lord, for blessing all of our speakers who come and speak your word. Thank you for blessing us during this time. you got to know that there is more in store. As we get ready to close, everybody, we want to make sure that as we continue to grow in God, as we continue to expand, that we are staying focused on God and we are seeing the way he wants us to see. I'm going to put one image on the screen, and I want you to do me a favor. I want you to focus on this picture. If you look at it, there are three dots in the middle. You might not be able to see the three dots, but if you kind of look at the middle of the picture, there are three dots. I just want you to keep your eyes on the screen for this entire time. I'm going to tell a story for two more minutes, and then we'll be over. Keep your eyes in that middle section. When Jesus was on the cross, he was between two thieves. And the Bible gives an interesting account of a conversation that Jesus was having with these two thieves. The Bible says that one guy on one side of him, keep looking at the screens, one guy on one side of him said something to the effect of, hey, Jesus, if you're really who you say you are, save yourself and us. You must not be what you say you are. And that man died on the cross beside the answer. And when he closed his eyes, he saw weeping and gnashing of teeth and fire and all kinds of negative things in hell. The thief on the other side of Jesus had a different conversation. He had different eyes. The other guy was saying, hey, if you are who you say who you are, won't you do this? Won't you do that? The other guy said, no. He said, both of us are wrong, but this guy is innocent. And he said something like, Lord, man, if you would just have me and take me, Lord, I know I'm wrong. I know I did wrong. But if you could just please just accept me. And Jesus turned to that one because he saw different. Jesus turned to that one and said, today, you'll be with me in paradise. Two thieves, but they saw Jesus differently. When that thief closed his eyes, I'm going to show you what he saw. You're still looking at the screen, still looking at the middle. Hopefully you, your eyes have been there for a while. Everyone do me a favor and close your eyes. Keep them closed. Do you see what I see? It's an optical illusion where if you stare at an image like that, with a certain degree of black, keep your eyes closed, and a certain degree of white, your eyes will basically make a tattoo of that image. You can try it again if you want to. And if you look at it long enough, just stare at it. You can blink while you do it. But if you look at it long enough and then close your eyes, doggone it, that same image with your eyes closed will appear 
inside your eyes. When we face our problems and our situations, you know what we need to do? We need to focus on God. We need to focus on Jesus. When we close our eyes to pray and we know this situation is going on and I don't have a solution for this or that, if we just keep our focus, keep our eyes seeing what God wants us to see, we can face our situations with that same perspective. I want to give God the glory for this opportunity. IBOC, you are absolutely amazing. <laughs>